helpful to hear the approach that he's, as he started the meditation was, he just thought, oh, I'll just sit in the chair and listen, and I'll just do it whenever I feel guided to do it. I'm not going to say I'll do it X number of times a day, or I'll do it at this time every morning and, and pick the times, which a lot of, um, I mean, that's what we learned when we were in college about, you know, good student study habits, you know, pick your spot and pick your times as if, you know, if you don't, <laughs> you'll never get it done. And, and this is a real approach in trust and really just trusting how I feel. And I think Joel Goldsmith was, or he was saying that Go Joel Goldsmith ended up doing it was like 20, 20, 30 times. 30 times. Yeah, 30 times a day just based on taking, doing the moments of quiet and listening when he wanted to. You know, I mean, <laughs> without, scheduling without scheduling it in. It. Yeah, he didn't, he didn't plan to do it any certain number or whatever, but that's what it came out. And some of them were sh rather short, but still, that was the thing too. He made a pact kind of with himself to say, I'm just going to do it and as long as I feel it's helpful and I'm happy and I'm not going to try to go beyond that. What a gentle approach. Now, you can see what he's saying in here is routines as such are dangerous because they easily become gods in their own right, threatening the very goals for which they were set up. That this whole section, how should the teacher of God spend his day, is kind of saying that initially, when you're first starting out, it can be helpful to maybe do it at the beginning of the day, at the end, and perhaps in between but it's giving some structure because the mind is too untrained, you know, to just let it let it go. But you can see that the whole point of the course is to move away from structure, structured time periods. Sometime last week I got up in the morning and and walked and had my headphones and was listening to a tape and then I did that the next morning. And at some point I think I decided that that would be good to do every morning. Get up and walk and listen to a tape. As if I knew, you know? Instead of getting up each morning and saying, what now? And then when that seemed to wind down, what now? What now? What now? I mean, who's to say that I'm ever supposed to take a walk again and listen to a tape? I don't know that. Really? And that's what you work towards. Initially, it may feel comfortable to do something. I mean, that was another thing that was in the book that you were reading where he, he experimented with. He actually <laughs> planned out his whole day quite tight with all these activities. Very rigid. Very rigid. And then he started to think, well, why should I call this a day? Because the sun rises and sun sets. I'm not getting everything done that I want to. So he ended up... Two or three days ago two or three solar days, he called a day. He started changing, <laughs> redefining day, you know, but, but again, you know, it's that loosening, loosening to the point that you're talking about is the point where it's more advanced. This is more precious than anything, any amount of money can buy. And the only time or the only way I lose sight of how precious the opportunity is, it seems like, is by sinking into familiarity and taking for granted what, you know, the opportunity. I have an image in my mind. I, one time I went to hear a, a blind man, a very wise blind man, Richard Shining Thunder, down in Cincinnati speak and I remember going into this little bookstore and just sitting there and listening to him and he he spoke he spoke very gentle and he got into a lot of deep ideas and everything and he would you know kept, keep going around and asking people you know if they experienced it too and everything and anyway they, they said let's take a break and immediately they, they it was, rah, rah, it was just a big hubbub. Everybody got up and was that, and they were going over. And he had made some tapes, and they were, oh, where's his tapes? Here's his tapes. Da, 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 da. And I remember just sitting there, kind of just waiting and watching. And then I'd say after about five minutes, 
Richard hadn't gone very far and didn't get involved in the hubbub. <laughs> you know, they were hubbub all of his tapes and this and this and that. And he just went back, sat down in his chair, and there's all this rah, 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 rah going on. I could hear this voice, please, please come back, come sit down. Our time is so precious together. We don't want to waste a minute of it, you know. And, <laughs> and, and there was that little voice, I could hear it. <laughs> With his rah, 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 and they, nobody was even attentive, you know. There he was sitting there, you know, wanting to go, to go in, and it's just to me, it's that's part of as we really get into this. There's a there's a reverence for God that starts to come with it, a real reverent feeling, not a reverent for one another. I mean, Jesus says, you know, that's not appropriate. Not even in conjunction with Jesus is not a reverence and awe is not a, an appropriate, but. To me, there's a, a real preciousness about the time we come together. And of course, that flies in the face of, oh, another day, life, well, I'll do what I always do, and I'll, you know, this and this. That's that kind of a consciousness that that is very familiar and customary. And to really stay attentive and to feel the excitement and the enthusiasm of questioning these beliefs as if... I mean, it's as if the mind's been sleeping for a millennium, <laughs> and now finally, <laughs> after a millennium of, of seeking for idols, now this is like the time of awakening. To me, that's like a time of rejoicing. I mean, that's like the time of, at the end of the prodigal son story, when the prodigal son finally, finally comes home, and his father runs out, and he's got a robe for him, and he kills the fatted calf, and he throws a big party. You know, to me, that's that, that's that passion that I feel right now that is like at the end of the prodigal son story. And I just, I think I've learned that I have to really nurture that. I can't just expect, you know, okay, passion, where's my passion switch? I want to turn it on today because it just, if I think I can turn it on and off, then what I find is when I turn it off and leave it off for a while and I turn it on, the hey, hey, <laughs> where's that charge? It seems like, uh, it just seems like the rut again, you know. So to me, it's it's important. I mean, it's worth all the effort and the, and the attention to keep the mind attentive and to keep the energy, like you've been saying, when you've been, I mean, you're drawn to read this book now. It's not like you read a few pages and or a few sentences and you say, golly, I'm waiting through this, what is this? But now it's like it's starting to get very meaningful and exciting and, and with good reason when it starts to feel exciting. I mean, this is a homecoming. <laughs> the routines of, I think of it kind of like ego autopilot, you know, <laughs> instead of saying, here, Holy Spirit, help me steer, it's kind of like clicking on the autopilot button and kind of just cruising for a while, and then until something blows up, oh, whoa, whoa, <laughs> hit the autopilot, hit the switch, yeah. try to grab control of the steering wheel again and pull pull the plane out of a tailspin. Or a thing that Raj uses, that man we were listening to, he uses the metaphor of the homing beacon. And I like that because it's kind of like you're in a plane and you're trying to come in for a landing. You know, you're trying to really land for your homecoming, and it's foggy. And you know, you have the the runway lights. There's like a there's a there's like a lighthouse that you can think of a beacon of a flashing beacon. And you kind of can, if it's foggy, you can kind of get off course and everything. But then through the fo through the fog, you see this thing flashing, and you say, oh, <laughs> got to get it went off a little bit to the right or left. And and to me. The Holy Spirit is like that flashing light behind the fog. That at, t at times it just seems like we we lose it, but then it, we see it again and we go, "Oh, there it is over there." Come back, you know, and come back. And that's been a helpful metaphor of just staying on the homing beacon, so, uh, stay attentive. <laughs>